right. Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Greetings from Christian Life Broadcast, a ministry of Christian Life Center right here in beautiful Palm Coast, Florida, 5200 Beltair Parkway. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, we have a special guest with us for this broadcast, one of my dearest friends on earth, Brother Mark Brown. And uh, he is all the way from the warm, sunny state of South Dakota. Um, and he's here with us for the weekend, continuing our renewal weekend. We've been having some amazing services. God has been moving in such a, a powerful way. And uh, the Brown family is always the icing on the cake. Every year they come and finish it out for us as far as those series of services. And we're so excited to have him here for that and also for this broadcast. And uh, I'm, I'm so excited to get into this man of God's life. I think it'll be a blessing to you in Jesus' name. So Brother Brown, welcome to the broadcast. We're so glad you're here, man. Well, thank you for letting me be here. Excited. Yes, sir. It's a privilege to have you. Um, so first thing I want to talk about is um, coffee. Yes, sir. So you are known to uh, enjoy a cup of coffee here and there, and you have uh, thoroughly rejected my coffee. <laughs> and so you, uh, I guess, would you, be, would you consider yourself sort of a coffee snob, or are you, uh, how, how did you get into coffee, sir? Oh, well, um, number one, uh, um, yeah, I'm, I don't know if I'm a snob, but maybe. I, I get into it. I enjoy it. It's the only hobby I have in life. I'm a pretty boring person. I don't hunt. I don't fish. I don't have any skill set. Like, so, like, coffee is the one thing I've thrown myself into. Um, it, it really all began. I was never really into coffee. But uh, when I got married, um, my wife wanted a cup of coffee, so I brewed one. And uh, so after we brewed a pot of coffee, we sit down for breakfast. And so I'm adding all my cereal ingredients to it, cream, sugar, you know, all that stuff. And then I go to sip it, and I look at her, and she drinks it straight black. And I'm like, Joey Cucamonga, you know? I'm like, <laughs> I felt, I literally, I just like, I want to turn in my man card. And um, and I was working at the airport, and uh, one of the stores we were over was Starbucks. And so I started trying to figure out how can I get to the dark side. And uh, so I incrementally worked my way away from the cream and the sugar and the foo-foo, and I finally got to drinking black coffee. Um, and I just, I don't know, there's something weird about it. The more I studied and read about coffee, the more intrigued I was. And um, I'm, I'm kind of like an all-in or all-out person. So whatever it is, I'm going to pretty much immerse myself into it. And um, after 10 years of working with Starbucks, um, I started venturing out when I go places and trying other coffee shops. And when I did that, a whole nother world opened up to me. Starbucks is real commercial. It's real just like, I don't know. Did you get free coffee working? Yeah. So like, I mean, I was getting it for free. You know, I get a pound for free every week while I work is free. And um, Could you make yourself coffee there for free? Yeah, yeah. And so, I, I mean, I was, I got into it. Like most of the employees at those stores and stuff, they don't, they don't get into it. It's just like a job, but I was weird about it. And I was like practicing latte art and all that kind of stuff and um, memorizing. I do blind tastings and try to differentiate which black coffee I'm drinking, what region it's from. And can, you, is that, can you do that? Like you can tell where the coffee comes from by I, tasting it? Stereotypically, you could identify, you know, what characteristic, where placement, if it's Latin America, Asia Pacific. If Sweet it's, mercy. I know nothing about coffee. Yeah. My Lord, that's incredible. Yeah, well, or it's pathetic. It's right. one of the two. So, but now I hate Starbucks. I'll, I'll, I, I, I don't, think I'll embrace incredible. Yeah, incredible. <laughs> But I hate Starbucks. I can't stand it. It tastes like Charbucks. Um, because I, like I said, I started going to this other route where I've learned about light roasted coffee, third wave coffee. And um, so that's what I do. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, coffee's my thing. So you've traveled with your family from South Dakota. Did you bring coffee with you? I did. What, what kind of coffee did you bring so with you? So I have coffee from one of my favorite roasters called Onyx from Fayetteville, Bentonville, Arkansas. Um, I, I drink so much from them that I have a wholesale account. And so um, I get it at actually cheaper than I would be able to 
buy a pound of Starbucks. And so um, we got a little coffee cult back home in South Dakota. And so we all kind of like split together, work on different coffees. But Onyx is probably my most typical go-to um, that I order to get home. But when I'm somewhere else, I'm branching out, discovering, learning. Did you bring a, a what kind of a, what's your uh, coffee making technique when you travel? So when I travel, I got something called an AeroPress and I got a hand grinder, grind the beans, put them in my little Is AeroPress. Is there a, an advantage to a hand grinder versus like a push button automatic? Grinder? Well, I mean, traveling wise, you know, I got to, I got to simplify. So I'm going to bring, I'm not going to bring a big old huge, like I got a, a niche grinder and um, I'm not going to pack that in my carry on because I never do check luggage. It's always carry on. And um, so I can't fit my niche grinder in my my carry-on. So, yeah, that's the hand grinder. It's, the goal is basically just that fr freshly ground coffee every single time. Um, in other words, if you have old, recent ground coffee, it's not as fresh. You're losing some of those flavors and aromas. And so... Does your wife drink the same style as you do? Yeah. Yeah. Initially, total no. Total unity. Yeah, total unity. It was, it was, a, it was a process of discipleship. <laughs> Um, but you know, she, she's fully converted and Thank uh, you, Jesus. I, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. And so you, we were discussing your, um, water as well. Yes. We're going to get spiritual soon, but this, this is spiritual. Yes. Can you elaborate on your water? My sir? Topo Chico. Yes, sir. So I, I Topo Chico is my go-to drink. I, I don't drink anything but black coffee, plain water, and Tobo Chico carbonate water. I don't nothing else. Nothing else. It's very rare that I drink anything outside of that year round. So, no sweet tea or or mm -mm. Sprite anything. Wow. Just water, water for health coffee. or just because that's your your palate. Um, both. Um, like since doing that, like drinking something sweet is like ugh. Um, but it is anything outside of that typically is unhealthy. Um, and I try to be somewhat a decent steward with this vessel, but you know um, that's a whole nother subject there but topo, topo chico um i love carbonated water and this reigns supreme as the utmost greatest carbonated beverage there is for carbonated water you got san pellegrino perrier you got aha you got Lacroix, you got all those varieties and they pale in comparison to the level of carbonation the intensity of the carbonation in this beverage bar none there's nothing else. This this is why I was telling you earlier. This is not a sponsored video, by the way, from Topo Chico <laughs> this, or Onyx Coffee. This is like acupuncture for the tongue. It's like a <laughs> thousand needles just infringing upon your palate and dissolving anything that was there. And it's therapeutic. It's wonderful. But really, before you drink coffee, to cleanse your palate, a carbonated water is the way to do it. And then after finishing your espresso, carbonated water again to reset your palate to clean it off, so you don't have that aftertaste of coffee, that after breath, all that kind of stuff. So carbonation in a coffee shop, there's a reason for it, but there's nothing like a glass bottle, not a plastic bottle of Topo Chico, a glass bottle. What's the difference? Chico. I mean, can you taste the difference? Are, One, are you there can, plastic you, bottles yeah, of Topo Chico? You will taste the difference. The 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 plastic ones are more rounded. This the glass ones are more sharp. And um, so it's, and when I open this, I'll, it'll take me two days to drink it. I'm, I'm a sipper. I, I kind of just like, you know, I, I don't down it. Um, so I'll drink it. I like it at a cold temperature, put it back in the fridge, come back two hours later, take a swig, back in the fridge two hours later, come back later, take a swig, put it in the fridge. And that can go as long as three days and it's still carbonated. It's mind blowing. Like you open up Perrier or San Pellegrino, at first you drink, you're like, oh, that's pretty good. And then like five seconds later, it's flat. And it's like, this is awful. There's nothing worse than like flat mineral water. It tastes awful. And so I'd rather have like tap water than flat mineral water. And so that's just, that's my opinion. It doesn't mean it's true, but it is. So. That's awesome. Well, it seems like you, um, <clears throat> whatever you do, it's, it's pretty precise and... Um, thought out and i want to i want to kind of show and, and ask you about your your life about your the process behind you everybody knows you in the pulpit they know what they feel when you preach they know the demonstration of the holy ghost that follows when you preach 
um, and us talking about coffee and, and uh, carbonated waters is a glimpse of you behind the scenes. But I want to I want to get into the uh, your life with the Lord outside of the pulpit. And um, were you were you um, are you first generation Pentecostal? Were you I'm, I'm second generation. My mom and dad they got in the church um, back in eighty one. Um, my mom she was in a gang. She went to prison for attempted manslaughter. My parents were on the verge of divorce, um, addic- uh, addicted to drugs, alcohol, and um, at that breaking point, they went to a small missions work. And um, my mom and dad were freaked out of their mind. They'd never been in an environment like that before. She was Catholic. How, how did they end up going there? Did somebody invite them or did just... Yeah, her her sister who got in, um, in the church uh, basically invited her. And so she she came to that invitation and um, in that service, my mom's like white knuckle death grip on the chair. Like this is the craziest thing. She was Catholic, my dad was Baptist, but they didn't, they never went to church or anything like that. And so they ended up, they listened to the call, altar call. The preacher said, hey, if someone comes out and sits in this chair, God will forever change the course of your family. And my parents let go. And uh, my dad got the Holy Ghost that service they went. Uh, they got baptized in Jesus' name three days later, um, but they they went home and they dumped all the alcohol down the drain, threw out all the cocaine, and they never went back. God instantly delivered them of their drug addiction and their alcohol Thank addiction. You, Jesus. And um, so they raised us in the truth. I backslid when I was um, I was twelve, maybe. How long before your mom got the Holy Ghost? You said your dad got it immediately. Um, that was in um, the end of November in 81, beginning to December. My mom got the Holy Ghost in February. So just a few months later. And um, so they've been um, baptized with the Holy Ghost pretty much since they almost went to the service the first time. My dad got baptized filled with the Holy Ghost right away. My mom got baptized right away, but it was a couple months before she got the Holy Ghost. And um, they're just amazing. I got amazing. How old were you at that point? I wasn't born yet. Mm. And so my I wanna I can't remember if my older brother was born or not yet. My eldest sister, she was born. She was from a previous marriage of my mother. My mom, as I said, she was in a gang and uh, I can't remember if he was the gang leader, but he was murdered. And uh, my my sister comes from that marriage. So we're, she's my half sister technically, but I I never say that. I just always she's my sister. Um, but she was, I don't know, she might've been six or nine years old when they converted. I I can't remember exactly age wise. I'd have to sit and think and do math and I'm not good at that. (laughs) But so you said you, so how were you when you got the Holy ghost? I was nine years old, nine years old. Um, I was asleep the entire service. Eli Hernandez (laughs) was preaching. Wow. And, uh, someone woke me up just to let me know my little brother got the Holy Ghost. And I was mad. And I was like, that little jerk. Because we're competitive. And I already knew he's going to run his mouth like, I got the Holy Ghost, you did. And all that kind of stuff. So I'm sitting there with just animosity, wrath, anger, rage. I'm going to beat him up when we get home kind of thing. And uh, anyways, I kind of started feeling bad. And I realized I want the Holy Ghost. And uh, got the Holy Ghost that same night. And so we both went home telling our mom, Happy Mother's Day. And so that was 30 years ago and uh, on Mother's Day. So I'm 39. I turned 40 this March. I'm getting old and crunchy. So uh, this might be my last breath, my last podcast. So you just pray for me. So you, you got the Holy Ghost, and then how did, how did you begin to develop spiritually from that point? I know you jumped ahead to 12 years old. Yeah. Um, man, it was, it was pretty crazy. For three years, um, I don't I don't think about this a lot, and I actually don't even really talk about it a lot. But um, from nine years old to twelve years old, it was just wild waves of the Holy Ghost that would come over me. I, I was nine or maybe ten when I felt God called me, and I didn't understand everything that was going on. But I would I would have dreams, I'd have visions. Um, my parents would have to carry me out of service. Um, I just like, I'd be on the floor just weeping, speaking in tongues. Um, and uh, it was just, it was weird. Like I'd never, you know, I, 
I never saw anything like that, experienced anything like that. And so here I'm a little kid. And when I felt like God was dealing with me to minister, I was, I was in my room and I was just having dreams and visions of hell. And uh, I saw family members there. I saw people there. And that's when I felt God tell me that that was my mission and purpose was to pull people out of hell. And um, Did that come in the form of an impression, a feeling, a, a vision, a, all the above? All the above. I, I, I really, it was so long ago, I really don't know if I was dreaming or if I was in a, a vision that I was awakened. But I was praying, speaking in tongues, and um, I, I saw very vividly, I could, I could still kind of see it, like my, my family members in hell and God saying, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use you to reach people. And um, then at 12, that's when I started like fading because I got in middle school and middle school changed everything because I started seeing things I never, fifth grade and sixth grade, <laughs> it's one grade. But like the lifestyle, the, the, the culture, all of it was totally different when I went to middle school. What city was this? Uh, Chicago, Chicago. In that area. Wow. I was in, in inner city. I was in the suburbs. Um, and um, I, it was a pretty decent area. It wasn't like the ghetto. But there was, there was some hood rat stuff that went on. So, But when I got to middle school, that's when you know I saw things and heard things I never seen and heard before. And I started feeling like I was missing out. I wanted to fit in. I started getting into fighting, hanging out with um, drug users, um, all that stuff. And that's when I backslid. You said you started getting into fighting? Yeah. Like out of necessity or out of? The first fight was, yeah. After, uh, actually, first couple maybe. Because, you know, I'm... I may look like I'm seven foot on this podcast, but um, I'm I'm closer to seven inches, so I'm 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 four foot nothing, and uh, so I was a little. I remember the first fight I was playing basketball, and uh, this this big kid came took the ball from me, and uh, I was like, "Give me my ball back," and uh, he's, "What are you gonna do about it?" And I'm like, "Give me my ball back," and I'm like, "What are you gonna do about it?" And so like he starts pushing me, and then he kicks me, and. Um, and everyone's gathering around. Everyone's watching. And I'm, I'm, I come about to like cry. I'm all brittle. And finally, man, I just something snapped, and I just started tearing into him. And, I was, and this, this guy was, he was tall. I mean, everyone looks tall to me, but he was, he was a pretty big kid. And anyways, man, I, I made contact with his nose. That thing snapped. There was blood pouring out. He fell to the ground. And then like everyone's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so then I get on him. I start kicking him, hitting him, beating him, and. Um, and the feeling that came from everyone watching the fight and like instant notoriety, everyone's you know talking about it and and they're like, Oh yeah, brownie's tough. That was like people call me brownie. brownie. They're like, Brownie, man, don't mess with brownie. You know, and uh and yeah, that was the the initial thing of it. And all of a sudden, like I started getting respect and and then I got more fights and I've been arrested a few times and thrown in the back cop car, brought home. Were Kicked you a, the aggressor from that point forward? Or oh you, yeah, yeah. I, I it was like a drug. Um, I know. Again, I know I'm little, but I'm, I'm a little. I used to be a scrapper, so I would I would look for fights from there then on out. And then I got into the skating culture and um, roller skating. <laughs> yes. Oh, skateboarding. <laughs> yes, I was a roller skater, and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, oh. so I got into that. Hey, don't mock me. Uh, you're all unorthodox. Yeah. I don't know what kind of skating. Yeah, no, it was figure skating. Figure skating. <laughs> we had our own, we had our own uh, band, a uh, gang. You figure know. skaters. <laughs> uh oh, here come the leotards. So we, um, uh, so I got into that, and uh, basically skating the whole skating. What kind of board culture. did you have? Huh? What kind of board did you have? Man, element. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I'm I'm so far removed from that element. It was element. Could and you do all the like the ollies and the all the yeah ollie ollie oxen free 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 and so yeah no so yeah I could do all that um, 
and that I did do inline skating for a long time as well. Rollerblading would be different than okay, roller. Okay, then. Roller so skating. I was on to something there. Yeah, but the, uh, roller skating is like, you know, you're wearing a tutu and, you know, it's all. Little four wheel uh, things. Four wheel, yeah. It's just a matter of alignment of the wheels. But yeah, I went to skate parks all the time. I snowboarded um, as well every year. I was all into that extreme sports and the whole culture. How were you at this point? Oh, well, I started like um, snowboarding when I was nine. But skating, I was probably 10, 11. And then like when I started meeting other uh, people in middle school that skated, like that's when I started seeing like the culture of it, which is anarchy, rebellion, anti-authority. I started getting the skating videos and I'd start listening to the music, which is all just wrath and anger and drugs. And the videos, is, you know, they just keep showing little images of people drinking, flipping off the police in cop cars, fights. And, you know, it's all on video camera. So we ended up uh, getting a video camera and try to emulate everything we saw. And so we go skating all downtown. And as we were skate downtown, we just basically try to repeat what we saw, not just the tricks, the moves, but the fighting, the violence, the the vandalism. We would just destroy properties and things like that. And um, so I became a very angry, violent, um, disrespectful person from that. And so I, I, I'd go pick fights just so we could videotape them. And uh, the last one I did um, fight that I stopped trying to pick fights was when I was messing with this guy. We had the video camera. We were ready to go. And um, y'all had planned on getting this on camera? Oh, yeah. We'd always look for something because we wanted to be famous, wanted to get sponsored, wanted to be cool, all that kind of stuff. And, anyways, this guy grabbed me, pulled a knife on me, held it to my throat. And that was kind of creepy. So um, I was like, I should maybe be careful, you know, picking a fight with somebody. Um, but I, I mean, I, I still fought and stuff. But like, I. I started being very calculated, <laughs> a little more calculated in fighting. So, yeah. And how long did that season, what, what age group? Or what so age? from my sixth grade year to my senior year in high school. And then I want to talk about your, your brother as well at this point, Brother David Brown, mm -hmm. who's an amazing man of God. What, what was he doing at this time? Was he in the home? Was he having the same sort of lifestyle? Was he doing something different? So David, out of all his siblings, so I got my eldest brother, my older brother David, two years older than me. There's myself, and then there's my younger brother who's two years younger than me. David's the one that remained faithful. He was just, he was godly. He's amazing. And um, me, I rebelled, and uh, my sister backslid as well. Go ahead. What was your perspective of david during that time was there a peace between the two of you did you resent his righteousness was there... i did resent his righteousness i mean we didn't like it wasn't just like fight and uh, nothing out of the ordinary of like civil rivalry sibling rivalry kind of stuff but i i definitely um when i became i was about 15 16 and then he was off to bible college and that's when i got like this animosity resentment anger with him um anytime he tried to witness and uh, you know my parents you know I, I created things that weren't true like oh you love david more than you love me you know because he you know he's perfect all that kind of stuff you know i get mad at him but you know david was interceding for my soul when i was uh, causing hell in the home and uh i was a bad influence on my little brother and i i get him i yeah I, there's if there's a, there's a number of things I I know God's forgiven me. There's a number of things I really I revisit in prayer sometimes just to remind myself that I need to I need to be thankful for God's grace and mercy. But I was a bad influence on my little brother. And um, where is he? He's not in the church. Um, he's doing better now. Um, he, he'll come to church every now and again with my my older brother he lives in the same city where my brother pastors but you know i um yeah i love my little brother and uh but he he stepped off and went and did deeper darker things than i did um but i initiated that you know i was a bad example and um i was causing a lot of problems in the church in the youth group i intentionally tried to uh, be a bad influence to the youth group just because my parents always forced me to go to church. I never had the option.
to be away from church. So you were going to church this whole time. You yes. Doing this other stuff. My parents, I give, I give them honor. I mean, I fought them. I mean, I caused a lot of problems, and um, I was just trying to get them to break and leave me alone and let me do what I what I wanted to do. And years later, my dad told me like they were at that breaking point. Not them quitting on church, but them just saying, "Fine." Just do whatever, Mark. Because I, I was sneaking out and I was going to the clubs. I was partying. I was doing whatever I wanted. But it was always a fight. And I would, I would try to do like, you know, aggressive skater hair and have all the spikes, you know, like, and, and my parents, I remember getting a, a physical altercation with my father over hair, you know. And um, I remember we got in a fight. I grabbed him. I was a wrestler in, in high school. And, <laughs> So, like, you know, when I didn't wear leotards as a figure scared club. club, I was like, you know, I'm going to wear leotards <laughs> as a wrestler. And uh, so, yeah, I, uh, I, it was what I enjoyed about wrestling. Were I, you, were you working out at this point? Were you like <laughs> lifting weights and stuff? Yeah, I was, I used to be heavy into like working out and exercising. I did all the time. Um, that started in middle school because, like, that to feed the anger and the rage, I just wanted to get stronger and and beat people up. And it sounds stupid, you know, looking back at it, but that's literally what I did. Um, I weighed one thirty five. I was benching two sixty five. Leg pressing nine. Um, I mean, I was I was into it. I would take the creatine supplements. I would I go to I think it was like G, yeah GNC. Get all I I was into it, and it was pretty stupid. Um, so I was I was very fit for my size and um anyways when i uh got off track i was a regional champion for the state of illinois um and I, you know i never wrestled before uh high school but like when the coaches I, i'd play football and i enjoyed like you know uh, hitting p people but my, my one of my coaches was uh, the the wrestling coach and he said you you do really good at wrestling, and I thought that was like rolling around on a mat with guys in tights. This is kind of weird, but he goes, "No, man, you could you could hurt people." And I'm like, "Okay," and I tell you what, there's I've never been in better shape than I was in wrestling. Is and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed wrestling, and um, but back to <laughs> my father, we were we were in a yelling at each other, and I grabbed my dad, and I threw him over over me in a headlock, and I had him on the floor. And I just, I was just squeezing his head, and um, I remember, um, like, I'm like, wow, I just did this to my dad. Like, first I'm feeling tough because my dad's, my dad's a tough person, and he easily could have just threw me off of him and just gave me the whooping I deserved. But he didn't respond. He didn't react. He just, um, he just looked at, me. he just looked at me, and um, I remember looking in his eyes and him looking at me, and he was just like disappointed, you know, and. Um, so I let go of him, and I, I ran. I don't remember what happened that day, but I remember I ran out of the house and left. And that's when I really just started, um, like, man, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? You were 17, 18? Yeah, I, was, I, was, I, I want to say I was my senior year. If it wasn't my senior year, it was my junior year. And, um, but that's when I, I just started having regret, really second-guessing, like, what am I, where am I going? And, and I, I, I just kept like going further and further from God because I felt like there's no hope. I'm, I'm so far into this. I'm, I'm so full of anger, wrath, unforgiveness, hatred. I was a very angry person, very angry. And um, it was my senior year of high school, just about to graduate, about to leave house and do what I want to do. And that's when um, I was in a church service and my pastor was preaching. Who was your pastor? Terry Cox. And um, he's no longer alive. He died of cancer. But he was a powerful, powerful preacher. And um, anyways, he, he was preaching one of those hellfire brimstone sermons. And, um, and it, was, he, it was called Remember the Amalekite. The short end of it is what Saul didn't kill ended up killing him. You know, he, he made an excuse for sparing some of the Amalekites. And at his last last breath, there he is leaning on the spear, trying to commit suicide. And uh, he asked someone to finish him off. And before the guy finishes him off, he goes, "You know, who are you?" And he says, "I'm the son of an Amalekite." And that was the very act that he was supposed to fulfill. That you know, he lost 
the kingdom when he didn't uh, obey God. And the point the pastor made is like this little thing that, you know, you've justified so long is going to be your death. And I knew, you know, and some of those things in my life. And I ran to that altar. And I just, I just, I felt, I was shaken. And um, I don't, I don't know how long it was, but it was just like, it was kind of like a replay of when I was like nine to 12, the moves of God that would come over me. And, um, and in, in that moment, after I prayed and repented, I, um, I asked the pastor for the microphone and he gave it to me, which is crazy. And I just started apologizing to the church. Um, I, I did, I, I caused, there's, there's a lot of people that are not in the church today because of the things I did and said and the way I treated them. And uh, so I, I asked the church for forgiveness and I, uh, reconciliation. And um, there was a lot of parents that hated me there. Not, I don't hate, but they were upset with me, things I did to their kids. And, um, and there was a healing moment there. I still, I still hurt, obviously, just thinking about it. Because now as I, I'm an adult, you know, I got kids, and I can't imagine someone treating my kids that way and corrupting my kids. And so um, that's how I got back in the church, and uh, I thank God for it. I tell you that as pastors, and you have a better perspective on it because it was your life, but that gives me so much hope for people we look at in our youth groups and in and, and the pews that are in abject rebellion against God to remember God's working on these people. God's dealing with them. And uh, man, that's a powerful story. There's, there's something you've told me in other settings I want you to I talk about it and, I, and kind of put it in a time frame for us. I remember you going to the ocean and your glasses and this being kind of one of the things, can you can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So yeah, I wish I could tell you when I when that moment happened, like you know, I was perfect, right with God. But it was it was a process, and that I don't when the when the altar call moment happened. Yeah. Okay. So I see. I wish I could tell you right then and there that I was on the straight and narrow, but it was still like I was still in high school. And I was still surrounded by the same friend group. But from that day forward, I, w- I wanted to make it right. So I would mess up, um, but I'd, I'd come back to God. I'd come back to the altar. And um, that was the season I went on spring break. Um, I, I, to be honest with you, I can't remember which moment happened first. I want to say it was the altar call that happened first. Um, but then I went to spring break and... Um, I was I was out in Florida, uh, Panama City, Florida, and uh, I was out of the ocean. I was basically it, I was partying, you know. I was going to the clubs, meeting girls, things like that. And um, anyways, we were going to meet with some girls that evening to go to a, uh, a club. And when we were doing that, a storm front came in. When that storm front came in. All of a sudden, the waves got huge, massive, and so my friend and I are out there beating the waves, getting thrown around in the water. And um, I want to ask you something and kind of get a clarification on something. Yeah. Before the end of the story, you were meeting up with girls. You were you, were you involved with girls during this season? Yes, sir. And quite obviously, that did not bring the fulfillment that it promised. Correct. Yeah, I I I struggle with lust from middle school till until my senior year you know and um there's other battles as well but you know i i definitely that was one of my biggest problems and addictions was girls but it didn't satisfy never satisfied but that was that was my addiction um i was always wanting to be you know with girls you know and so um and so here i am i prayed through um and then I'm in Florida for spring break because I already I already purchased yeah that's that, that I already purchased everything, and so we didn't want the money lost. My friend and I went went out there, and um, and so we're like hey, it'll be we'll be good behave. But I mean the scene of Florida at the beach is is not uh, conducive for uh, moral thoughts, and so basically I'm spiraling back into it. 
and so as I'm spiraling back into it, um, we're at the about to go meet these girls, but we're in the water uh, during the storm that came in, and my friend loses his glasses in the water. And uh, I was like, "All right, we gotta go, we gotta go." And he goes, "Man, you gotta help me find my glasses." I'm like, "I find, can't find your glasses in the ocean, you know? What idiot wears glasses <laughs> in the ocean, you know?" Um, and so he's like, "Oh yeah, you gotta help me." And so my parents are gonna beat me, and his parents they they really probably would. And so I felt bad for him. So I'm, I like I I look for his glasses in the ocean, which is stupid. Is know, it way, daytime? No, I mean it's like just about probably four or five, I don't know, evening's coming. Okay. And uh, so, but there's daylight, but it's dark skies because like the wind's blowing and all that stuff. It's some sort of storm or something. And uh, so we're looking for his glasses. I'm like, bro, we got to hurry up. We got to meet with girls. And and uh, he goes, you got to help me find them. And so I'm like, oh my goodness. So I put these snorkel goggles on and I'm looking in the water looking for them and the waves hitting me, seaweeds hitting me. And I'm like, this is so stupid. This is so stupid. And uh, finally, I got out of the water. I'm like, God, if you help me find his glasses, I, I won't go to any of these clubs. I won't go out with these girls. I'll just, I'll go tourism, you know, in Florida. And uh, I put the goggles back on. I get in the water. And I, I'm not exaggerating one iota. This is, this is exactly how it happened. I got in the water. A wave splashed. And me underwater, the glasses came up and hit me in the face, landed in my hand. I didn't go reach for them. I mean, they hit me in the face and landed in my hand. And I'm like, what? And I get out of the water. I'm shaking. I, I'm just shaking. And my friend's still looking for his glasses. I don't know how long he was still looking. I was just like shaking. I, I, never, I was like, wow, that's crazy. And um, my friend goes, what are you doing? I go, I found your glasses. He goes, that's awesome. I'm like. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> and I give him his glasses. I go back to the room and I repent and I pray through and we didn't go clubbing, carousing or nothing like that after that. Was that a pivotal moment that as was, far as your trajectory yes. as well? From that, it, from best my memory I could tell, I did not relapse with with uh, fulfilling lust with girls. Um, so that that was the end of my senior year. And that reminds me so much of the gifting that you have because you you look at these men of God in the Old Testament, Jonah, he's a prophet of God. He's running from God. And yet in Jonah's darkest moments, he's still giving clarity to in his backslidden state on who God is in his rebellion. Hmm. In the, the seminal moment, the pivotal moment that changed your trajectory is a moment where you're helping somebody else see clearly. And, and that's what you still do to this day. You help others. You simplify things in scripture and bring clarity to people's lives. And God used you in that moment in the physical because this guy's going to be able to see better because of Mark Brown. Wow. And that's, that's what you do to this day. Wow. You help people see better. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God, God is so merciful. And um, I, I frequently revisit those places with God in prayer. When you, what do you mean? When I pray, um, I, I bring, I know God forgives and washes sins away, but I don't want it to become something that's so distant to me that I don't appreciate. Now, others may not have to do that, but I do. Because um, I could get, if I'm not careful, I, I can forget. How do you visit those places? I talk to God about them. Just bring them back up and go I through. Bring, so I go, I'll say this in prayer. God, I, I know you forgave me. I don't doubt that at all. But I bring it up because I, I, want, I want to appreciate where I'm at. I don't want to get self-righteous. I don't want to get holier than thou. I don't want to get arrogant. I want, I want to stay near to the cross. I want to stay near to where you found me. And there's multiple things I bring up. Some of them I brought up to you. There's others I didn't, you know. Um, I, but I bring it up, and uh, it helps me when I go and preach, say, an event or a church service or do a Bible study that I don't come with a holier than thou aspect because I do preach pretty direct, 
I do challenge people, but I always try to do it from the side of like, I came from there. That's where I was. And I, I hope people can sense and feel that that's my spirit and my approach, that I'm not coming to attack you. I'm coming to let you know God can redeem you. This is what he did for me. And that's been very helpful um, over the years. And um, yeah. That's powerful. Thank you, Jesus. So the next season, you, you have that moment with God. You, you begin to change your lifestyle. What does your lifestyle look like before? Is the next big moment Bible college? Yeah. So from there to Bible college, what's going on with your, you and Jesus? So I, I was just think I didn't understand why I was at Bible college other than I, as clear as I heard God tell me to go. Did you go immediately to Bible college? Yeah, that, that um, fall semester. So I thought I was just going to be a saint in a church, make some money, and maybe get married one day kind of thing. And um, unexpectedly, during that summer of you know getting right with God, um, God pulls me that direction. My pastor gives the blessing. I talk to him about it. And um, I don't know why I'm at Bible college. Looking back, I understand why. But um, my past, my current pastor was Jim Sleeva, is one of the instructors there, and a powerful man, very humble, very prayerful, very mission, very kingdom minded. He he took me under his wing, and basically exposed me to the world of outreach. And um, that's all I ever did. I shadowed him, and I did outreach all throughout Bible college. I was doing, I won't list them all, but thats I was very engaged, very involved. How long were you at Bible college? Four years. Indianapolis, Indiana, Bible college. And um, we were there for four years. In my senior years, when God dealt with me about where I'm at now, and that's South Dakota. Who's better, IBC or Urshan? <laughs> I've not been to any other Bible college, so I, I, I can't speak. But, you know, I, sorry, I, I, am very, I am very biased towards Indiana Bible College. And I love the focus and the purpose, you know, which all, all Bible colleges, I'm sure that their, their focus and purpose is missions and ministry. But I love IBC, so that's my bias. Um, but you it, lived in, obviously, Indiana during that time? Yes, sir. There for four years. And... Um, my senior year is when God dealt with me to go to South Dakota. I had no idea why I'm going to South Dakota. What did that look like? That that, that process. Um, so all I heard him tell me to do is go there, not where in South Dakota, but or not not even what to do. He just says go to South Dakota, and um, so prayed about it and talked to pastor about it. Got the release, got the blessing, and I reached out to the superintendent and I told him, "Hey, my wife and I." We'll do whatever you want. You met your wife during that season at IBC? Yeah, my sophomore going into junior year Bible college, met through a friend. Um, was Jordan at She was IBC? not at IBC at the time, but her friends were, and that's where the connection. And my wife was going to nursing school and uh, in North Dakota where she's from. And um, anyways, we ended up getting married, and uh, she does go there for a year at IBC because I finish off. Bible college, um, and she goes one year through it. And um, at the conclusion of it, um, that or that year is when God dealt with us to go to South Dakota. I'd never been there. And um, so the superintendent had the idea for us to go and relaunch uh, a work that was closing in Watertown. And I'm like, you want me to do what? You know, because I, I never felt like I was a preacher. I never felt like I was a pastor. I felt like I missed the boat, you know, from when God dealt with me when I was you know, between the age of nine and 12. Mm. And so all I did- Like you, if you would have only started then, you could have done something for Like God. if I wouldn't have backslid, if I would have been faithful, you know? So I just didn't think- Boy, that's a kind of a common lie mm -hmm. that Satan uses against people, isn't it? Yeah. If you, yeah. Would, have, if you would have only capitalized on, on that season, but now you're disqualified somehow. Yeah. And so I, I felt like I, I can't do that. So I was just given to outreach because that's- that's what I'm allowed to do. And I, I got addicted to outreach and Bible studies. That's all, like four years of Bible college, I never preached chapel service. You know, they have student chapel and everyone's preaching. Like, I never did that. Um, so I wasn't seen as the preacher. And um, they never asked you? Mm -mm. So um, the uh, 
one year, my senior year, they there there is one caveat that uh, that, that I guess it was called preaching, but I was asked to do an announcement for tent revival my senior year in the chapel service, like between pre they'd have one preacher worship, then another preacher. They have two students, student chapel. And so they asked me at that chapel if I would do um, uh, announcement for uh, the revivals, tent revival, because I was doing two tent revivals. I do the uh, tent revival in the mo morning and then tent revival, not in the morning, the um, first semester and then another tent revival, second semester. What was your role at the tent revival? I was I was putting it all together. It was an area we were doing outreach in. I would do outreach there. And um, in that outreach, like we would do bread runs. We have bread, donuts, pastries everywhere. We go in this ghetto, in this neighborhood. I'd pick up all those kids, bring them to a storefront. We would do Sunday school, like non-traditional setting Sunday school. I would bust those people, bring them to church on Sunday evenings. In the mornings, we would do uh, open up a, uh, a soup kitchen where I was feeding homeless people. Um, my wife and I, we'd open it in the morning, prepare the meal, all that stuff. So I was very involved. So all of that we would funnel into tent revival to have a tent revival service to see people, you know, have uh, baptized with the Holy Ghost, etc. Were you the speaker at the tent revival as well? Or was somebody else speaking that? So I did, um, I would do like skits. You know, that was like one of my things. And then I, one year, um, I, I did, I, again, I didn't call it preaching. <laughs> like I was, I'm going to speak. Like that's, that's what it was in my mind. I'm just going to speak. And so I would, I would share, you know, scripture, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And it wasn't yelling. It wasn't screaming, running around, you know, doing calisthenics. I was very calm and I would just talk. And uh, cause again, I didn't think I was a preacher, but back to the chapel service, they asked me to do announcement. And then also like, we're going to bring up our next speaker, you know? And I'm thinking like, I guess I'm doing the announcement after. And they brought me up and I was like, I'm supposed to, and I went up there, I said, I was like, I'm supposed to just do an announcement for tent revival. And uh, and so I just talked about the tent revival and that was it, you know, that was my preaching moment, I guess. But um, yeah, and then uh, anyway, so fast forward to being at um, South Dakota, um, pastor told me to do what the superintendent told me to do. So I just did it. And so that's where I began, you know, preaching, pastoring, church planning. And um, that's, that's how it all unfolded. So really my, my preaching, my ministry, my communicating really all stems from outreach and Bible studies. That's how I learned to communicate to people is just across the table, discussing scripture, discussing the word of God. And I, I treat preaching the same way. I better understand my call now that you know, I never heard God tell me to pastor. I never heard God tell me to 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 uh, be in Watertown, but I did hear God tell me to go to South Dakota. And now I've been there 17 years and I understand what God's called me to do. He didn't call me to a city. He called me to a land. He called me to, to not pastor. He called me to reach a region. And so that's my focus. I pastored. I still pastor, you know, um, but I pastored one work for 15 years and now I'm pastoring three new works that we started in the past year and a half and because uh, I'm trying to, to start new works across South Dakota to get an apostolic witness in all 66 counties. And so my mission, my purpose, my goal, my call is, is to reach a land, a region, and that's what I do. So, yeah. Anyway, the Bible says what Romans 11, 29, the gifts and callings of God or without repentance. And that God opened my eyes to that, you know, that, you know, he didn't take away the gift. He didn't take away the call. And uh, was that a process of, of grasping when you went to South Dakota? Was that a fight to grasp to yeah. say, Hey, God did not change his mind about me. I, I really, I really struggle with confidence. I really struggle with inferiority complex, low self-esteem, and when my prayer life grew and my devotional life and consecration grew, that's when I began to find my identity and my value system was mm -hmm. from God. And when God began to, to validate me, not people, because I'd always try to, going back to like the fight, you know, and um, in middle school, I just, I wanted validation and I wanted, I wanted people to affirm me and um, to respect me and, um, so that was, I guess, 
one of the early stages of it where I was addicted to it. And that that transpired still. I wanted people to, you know, to to like me, to respect me, to affirm me, well, all that kind of stuff. And so really I was just an insecure person. Um, but when I was removed from people and I was in isolation and it was just me and God, God God began to restructure my value system and where I draw value from. And the more time I spent in God's presence, the more confident I became not in others, but the relationship. And I, he's my father. And I, I walk around as God, like I'm God's favorite kid. Like I'm not a beggar. I'm a child of God. And so God began to help me in the way I prayed. I stopped begging for things. I stopped trying to earn things because my, my pastor rebuked me a number of times. He says, you know, your problem is, Mark, you're a Catholic. You keep trying to earn the love of God. Mm. You keep trying to work to, to that you deserve this. Because I, I worked hard in Bible college. That's all I was doing was outreach. And I didn't, I didn't see it. I didn't know it, but I was, I was trying to compensate, you know, for all those years I threw away thinking that this will make up for that. If, if, I, if I win this many souls, if I teach this many Bible studies, if I do all this outreach, you know, God will love me. God, God will love me. He'll love me. But that's, that's not where I, that's not how I, you get the love of God. It's re, just being in a relationship with them and feeling that love. And um, now, you know, when I minister, all that stuff, it's, it's from a place of confidence, not arrogance, not low self-esteem, not insecurity. I, I, and some people misinterpret confidence or direct um, ministering as arrogance, but it's like, I promise you, I never, I, every time I preach, I'm saying, God, give me the attitude needed for the anointing wanted. I want to be anointed, but I got to have the right attitude because anointing with the wrong attitude is destructive because anointing destroys yokes. But a wrong attitude, it will not destroy a yoke, it will destroy the person. And so I, 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 I always am reminding myself, you know, this is where God brought me from. But God loves me and God's going to use me. I'm going to be a vessel for him, a channel, a conduit. And so I, when I minister, it's from a place of, of confidence because of my presence with God, my position with God. It reminds me of, of Paul talking about his years where he hurt the church. And I imagine there was a battle for him as well of, of guilt and trying to make up for lost time or damaged souls. And um, you can see the, the perspective, you know, he said, because I persecuted the church of God. I, that, that was still something he openly discussed, didn't hide it. But um, the feeling and the perspective of it, God had to heal him too to have that, that healthy anointing and healthy flow of the Holy Ghost through him. Wow. I want to, um, I don't want to exhaust you, but I want to, no, I want to get into some details of, of when you went to South Dakota and um, you talk about how God, you, when you were kind of disconnected from people, I imagine just geographically that's going to happen mm -hmm. uh, versus Chicago and Indiana. Um, the setting is very different people. Can you talk about that natural the the difference of South Dakota? Yeah, well, it's a different culture than you're used to. It's a different. Yeah, you know. Well, in in Chicago, we held our guns like this. In South Dakota, we hold them like this. So I got to get adjusted to that now. Um, but that is a difference. Uh, isolation. I mean, you know, Chicagoland area is just mass population. It's constant, constant, constant. And um, then even the culture of being at Bible college, you're constantly around people of God, you're having church seven to 10 times a week, you know, depending on your involvement. And so it's nonstop Bible, nonstop fellowship, nonstop being around people your age. And you go to South Dakota and your nearest fellowship at that time was a hundred miles away. And there's only six churches in the state. My wife and I were 22 when we went and the next youngest minister was in his 40s, and then after that, 50s, and after that, 60s and 80s or 70s or whatever it was at the time. 
And um, I never felt isolation, experienced anything like that. And then the pace of life. Very was that a good feeling? Was it something that was, oh, oh okay. I, it just, I, like I was dying and get, being destroyed. So the process, for it. the process you were in was not a comfortable process. No, no, it was, it was miserable. You know, I, I got depressed, especially when there wasn't results. Um, Cause in Bible college, I mean, I had no problem gathering a bunch of people. I had no problem, you know, um, bring them to church. Uh, and I, there's a number of things that I go in direction here, but one of the big deals was I, in Bible college, there was a system and I could bring those people to that system, to that environment where they're surrounded by praise, they're surrounded by worship, they're surrounded by all of that. But in in South Dakota, I couldn't bring anyone to anything. You know, like it was just, my wife and I, and and basically God began to show me that I was I was riding the coattails of other people's sacrifice and response, uh, you know, consecration and devotion, and I was depending on their atmosphere for the people I was funneling in. I was doing good works, but like I I never really was an atmosphere changer. I was I was I was vital or whatever the word would be to help facilitate bringing souls in. But I wasn't one that would change an atmosphere with my praise, with my worship and things like that. And so like all of that depended upon me and I wasn't ready for it. The One of the destructive things that happened for me is I never adjusted my consecration for the next season I was walking into. Mm. I didn't. I didn't change my prayer life. I didn't change my worship. I didn't change anything. And the season I was I was in was different, and it required greater prayer. It required greater consecration, and you know I didn't know that at the time, but that's what was going on. How did you learn that? How did when when did it catch up and go beyond? Oh, when I when I was depressed and quitting and turned in my license and everything was falling apart. How long from when you got there to that time? A year. Um, a year that happened. And when that happened, I mean, I was, and you know, this is a whole nother subject matter. And it's something I, um, is, that's when I fell again. That's when I relapsed into pornography. Um, and it was that first year, cause I hit rock bottom. And when I hit rock bottom and everything was just falling to pieces, like I ended up going back to my old life. Uh, not, not other women, things like that, but like because I had this moral um, stance in my life now, faithful to my wife, things like that, and that's that's how I end up tri- re- re-triggering, relapsing into that world, and that's when I, I was turning in my license, I was done, I was quitting, I was depressed. Boy, that's a that's a powerful point, man, because it seems like the the spirit of pornography is is extremely linked to hopelessness. Yeah, I, I was hopeless. And um, so the to, trying to go back to your original question, what, what the heart of it was. Um, when, when did you come to that realization that you needed to yeah. go? So, so when, it, when basically when everything spiraled out of control and I hit rock bottom, depression, quit, hopelessness, despair. And that's a, that's a whole other story. Um, but God brought me through it. I had a wife that fought, interceded, prayed for me. I had a district superintendent that fought for me, prayed for me, interceded, a pastor, et cetera. And when I, when I got out of that, that's when God began to help open my eyes of what I need to change, what I need to do. And that's when my prayer life changed. That's when my Bible reading life changed. That's when fasting, everything, everything changed after that, when God delivered me and set me free. Did you see immediate changes externally or was it all internally first and then the external caught up later or was it linked? What aspect of the external? Revival, souls? Oh, no. (laughs) I I wish, I absolutely wish, but it wasn't until, in the sense of souls and revival, man, it wasn't until year seven things started turning. So God did this intense inner work in you for a season of seven years, rebuilding, restructuring, strengthening. Yeah. That seven years, man, is the hardest in my life. The first year was just 
mis you know miserable that second year you know trying to recover and then the third fourth fifth sixth year you know that's like i mean we weren't seeing it was it was almost eight years before i saw one person get the holy ghost in the service i preached did right. you have people coming to church yeah how many how many people did you start with a group of people or no it's my wife and i and one person that was uh, that was left from that work uh, that was in the process of closing so, so you stepped up to the pulpit and there's one person one person in the audience you're preaching to including your wife yes sir no kids at this point nobody yeah so you're preaching to two people yes what was that like um quite fun you know <laughs> you know you, you can only tell your wife to repent so many times <laughs> and so uh, she's you know, still working on it, you know, so. But, I mean, there's times where it was just me and one person. Like, there's times, like, my wife wasn't there. Um, you know, I can't remember whether she went to go visit family or something like that. And, you know, I tell people this when they ask me, what's it like to preach NAYC or General Conference and all those people? I'm like, I go, yeah, there's there's some nervousness to it, but there's nothing like preaching to one or two people or five people or 10 people, the the nervousness of that far surpasses because mm. you can't hide behind the lights, the camera, the action. You can't, you don't have a worship band to take it to the next level. You don't have a roaring crowd that helps create that momentum, that atmosphere. And going back to like what I said, Calvary, Tabernacle in Indianapolis, all of that was there. But when we came here, it didn't have any of that. There was so like I was exposed. I was exposed, you know, for what I either had or didn't have. And so basically that seven years, God was forging in me, developing me to 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 depend on his presence, depend on him, and not to worry, not not to rely on anything else and to be the atmosphere changer. So I would mm -hmm. have to create the altar call. I would have to be, I would have to exhibit praise and worship. I would have to model praise and worship. I'd have to model what an altar call was. I'd have to model everything and all that got instilled in me. And then determining to do it regardless of response because there was, there's no Pentecost in, in, when I say no Pentecost, there's very little Pentecost in South Dakota. The culture is Catholicism and Lutheranism. It's just dead and dry. And they think we're all cult. They think we're freaks, you know? I mean, you clap your hands, that's like a big deal. You lift a hand, that's a big deal. You raise your voice, that's a big deal. And so they, they think we're weird. And so trying, and so doing that in the midst of people just staring at you and looking down at you and all that kind of stuff, it it formed a, deter, it, a determination in me. You know, I'm... I'm pretty driven now. I'm like, there's very little that can derail me from what God told me to do because I did it for seven straight years with very little in the room, very little response. I know what God told me. And so anyways, um, I don't remember the point we were trying to make here. Well, just the feeling in, in, in the, the time that you started seeing external um, results. results. Did How long with just two people? Oh, maybe a couple months. Like we started having a few more after that, you know. But I would say our average time, our attendance, we'd have seven to ten people for the first year, uh, and an amazing day would be fifteen. Mm. Um, and then I, I would say you were working at Starbucks during this. I was time? Work, yeah, Starbucks and the Boys and Girls Club, and then also. Um, when I wasn't doing the boys and girls clubs, it was Starbucks and the airport. So for eight years, I worked two jobs, and um, that because that's that's all I could do. You know, I didn't know I, we had to try to make ends meet. Was that was that financially sustaining you guys, or was there also other things, supplementary? Incomes? So we were we were struggling. Like we were we weren't we weren't doing very good. We weren't making ends meet, and um, we ended up getting some help um, from. Uh, North American Missions Christmas for Christ, um, where they gave us uh, a monthly amount to help us with groceries. I don't remember what the amount was, but it was it was very helpful. It was it might have been two three hundred dollars a month, something like that. But that's what we used to get groceries. Um, but you know, we I worked at Starbucks, so that meant I made no bucks, and uh, that was that was our our, our life. And um, but. It was after those seven years, you know, we started seeing more and more momentum. 
And, um, you know, now we, we have a great thriving apostolic church in South Dakota. And now we're basing from there and trying to get new work started. So like we're reliving it all over again. You know, just the other week I preached to one person. You know, I'm in what the, city was that in? That was in Webster. I was, I'm in the, we eat in the basement of a courthouse. And I'm in the basement of a courthouse and I got my acoustic guitar out. I'm leading worship with one person just staring at me. And I get done worshiping, then I'm preaching to one person. And um, that's old, old territory for you. Yeah. And so, like, it's not, it's not as debilitating as it was before, but. What it does, it's just reopened again a, a value and appreciation for where God's brought us from, and um, and again I I have to rely on Him all over again, and uh, so because God did when God spoke to us about stepping out and starting new works, He told me He goes you you're comfortable, you know which we. Watertown, we go that year. We got uh, we hit 100 for a first time. You know, we finally broke the 100 barrier, and um, and in that in that season, God dealt with me about turning the work over and letting Pastor Jared become the associate pastor, become the senior pastor. And God said, "You're comfortable after you've worked how many years 15, to get 100? 15. So 15 years, 100 people finally." And God said, oh, you're too comfortable. You got to turn it over. Time to step out. Yeah. And, you know, I never, how do you get comfortable in South Dakota? But the reality is you get comfortable anywhere doing anything. And um, and so I, I really feel like I've, I've stepped into my call and to my purpose. I believe those, those 15 years forged and prepared me for what I'm supposed to do. And um, that's to reach a land um, and to help help others catch that vision. And so it's been pretty awesome, you know, to see the what God's doing in South Dakota now. In in the past few years, you Jesus. know, we went from six works to fourteen works. I just found this out recently, a couple months ago. Like uh, fourteen may not sound like much to anybody, but um, our district's more than doubled. And right now, in, in uh, North America, South Dakota is the fastest growing United Pentecostal Church district. And so to God Jesus. be the glory for yes, that. Sir. And there's an excitement in our district. There's an excitement amongst the ministers and others starting works and starting preaching points and starting daughter works. And it's, it's awesome. It really is awesome. Um, but it's, it's been a journey and it's not been easy by any means. And it's not easy now either. Um, you know, we're trying to break ground in these three towns um, and we've seen some great things, but we've seen a lot of adversity uh, right now in one of the towns called Millbank, the town of 3,300, you know, we're, we're facing attacks. Uh, everyone's, you know, not everyone, but there's a number of rumors spreading throughout the community. We're a cult. We had a great traffic flow coming in, but once rumors started getting out and all that stuff, the traffic turned off. And, you know, we would have, you know, 15, 20 people there in service, and now it dwindled down to three. Um, but, like, you know, these are the people we're working with. And so, like, you know, we're combating that right now. And then that town of 1800, you know, we'd ha we had people come in, and then this one church we were renting from kicked us out. Uh, they and, and then people cut down our signs and vandalized our signs, threw it away, you know. So in these small towns, we're facing some pretty intense resistance. And I've learned that the smaller the town, the bigger the stronghold. And mm. um, it's, it's very interesting. God's just kind of messing with my head and showing me some things in the spirit. And the, the necessity of reaching these small towns because geography equals authority. And uh, these are, I believe, gates of heaven. And the, the more we can close the gap it takes for the distance for someone to find truth, we're gaining territory and we're, we're building a new stronghold. Um, but man, I'm telling you, the, the battles in these towns, they're greater than the resistance we felt in Watertown. And Watertown, you know, is the fifth largest city in South Dakota with 20,000 people. Um, and that has strongholds. But, Sioux Falls is the largest? Yeah, yeah. There's with how many people? Close to 200,000. And there's not even a million people in our state. But Sioux Falls is the, the big dog. And uh, Sioux Falls doesn't feel like South Dakota. Neither does Rapid City. They're just very different than the rest. They're very much South Dakota, but the culture of Sioux Falls and Rapid City is very different than the rest of uh, the state. But 
yeah, it's it's been it's been pretty awesome, and I'm I'm very thankful to be a part of it. God would allow me to uh, to be there. I've been there 17 years now. So. And you're you're the superintendent of South Dakota. Yes, sir. This, How old were you when you became superintendent? 36. 36. Yes, sir. And so this um, I'm fulfilling my fourth year right now, and. Um, I don't know if the brethren will ask me to serve again or not. And if not, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm at peace with it. Um, but all I've known in South Dakota is serving at a capacity in the district because the need's there. Um, out of 17 years, 16 of them, maybe 15, I've either been youth president, uh, presbyter, or superintendent um, because there, was, there's just, there wasn't enough labor uh, hands on deck to be involved and so by default like, I got asked to serve and uh, it's been an amazing process that I never would have got somewhere else um, but be because of being there at a young age I've been exposed to a lot I've experienced a lot and um, and it's helped I'm very thankful for it so I want to ask you a question about you know when people look at you you've kind of done it all there's a there's a long list of things god's used you to do in multiple venues multiple locations you've gone from preaching to one person to preaching to what 35,000 people or more and um i want to ask you what gives what brings the most fulfillment are there things that you had in your mind that this would be the ultimate versus things that, oh, I, I would despise that and have those things switched? I don't know if I'm articulating that properly, but what, what, what has brought you the most fulfillment? Um, it's, you know, there's the, the familial thing, you know, family, and then there's the spiritual thing regarding things of the church. Um, and regarding church, kingdom of God element, I, I love, I genuinely love teaching a Bible study to a hungry soul that's receiving. I, I genuinely, there's nothing like being involved in someone's life one-on-one -on -one and watching them grow and develop. That brings me much fulfillment. Another fulfillment that I have found, I think, has become my new, I don't know, Focus, passion is developing leaders. Um, when I see someone that has a call on their life and potential or a desire to do something for God, and, you know, I, I call it, I say they're fat. They're faithful, they're available, and they're teachable. The fat is the Lord's. And um, when someone has those three attributes and they just want to receive and learn from anything that my wife and I have experienced. I, I love it. Like that, that there's nothing like it. And so training leaders, and so consequently, we've had a number of licensed ministers come out of the works. And um, each town that we're in, there's a couple that goes to that town, a husband and a wife. And on the drive there, training, teaching, instructing, telling them what's going to happen, what we're going to do. And then on the way, way back, decompressing what happened, what I felt, what, what I was doing, what, you know, just teaching. And it's been, I love it. I absolutely love it. And now, you know, all three couples, you know, they're, they're licensed uh, ministers. One was already licensed, um, but the other two couples are now licensed. And um, that brings me joy because my goal is not to stay the pastor of those works. My goal is to, to be the groundbreaker, to raise the caretaker, and move on. And that's, that's what I feel like my purpose is. And man, I, if there's anything More I could just... More of an apostleship role. Yes, sir. Um, when, when, if there's something I could just give myself to, would be that. If I, if I could just do that. I love, I love teaching the Bible studies, but I really feel like like that's not my, that's not where my per, my focus and purpose is right now, even though that's what I need to do, and I'm I probably will always do it because that's just part of who I am.
But if I can just simply train and develop people, I, I love that more than preaching an event. I love it more than anything else. And so this is, this is new. We've done it for years, but I guess I didn't realize that. Because when we were trying to get a bunch of people come to the church, I, um, we would get a bunch of people, then they leave, a bunch of people leave, that kind of thing. And God told me to slow down and grow and to duplicate ourselves. And I started working with one person at a time in the church that was faithful, available, and teachable. And that's how we ended up you know, raising up you know, youth pastor, associate pastor, ministers, was we just duplicated ourselves into somebody. And when we slowed down and grew, all of a sudden multiplication began to happen because now it's not just my wife and I doing it, we have another person. And once they were trained ready to go, we went to the next person, trained them ready to go, next person. And it was years, it took years. And now you've been to Watertown, the core of our church, it's, it's powerful. I mean, the core of the Jesus Church of Watertown, it's amazing. Um, our pre-service prayer, we've heard feedback so many times from people that have came and visited, and this is what they say. Uh, this is multiple, multiple people um, that never interacted with each other. I've just visited. They said, man, stepping into your pre-service prayer is like the Friday night conclusion of a conference in an altar call. My Lord. They're like, Thank we've, you, Jesus. They, we've never felt anything like that. And then they say, I've never heard anyone pray like that. The words that you guys use, the statements that you say, the spirit, you know. But it took years of instead of trying to reach a bunch of people in investing in one person and that's the core of the Jesus church is people that we invested one at a time and then like when you'd come that's also the Jesus paradigm yes sir you know he he had 11 absolutely and like you know when you would come and other ministers i would have them invest in that core that we were trained to develop and it just it just grew them even more, and um, so that's where I get my most fulfillment um, currently. It's incredible watching you. You know, you you talk about the season of your greatest pain and darkest moments. That's seven years, and um, how God, because you stayed in process, the place of your greatest pain and your greatest struggle. You know, when you talk about South Dakota, man, there's a fire that begins to light up in your eyes and in your spirit. And you can feel, I think it would take a team of horses to draw you out of that region. Yeah. You know, the, the place that of your greatest struggle has become the place of your greatest purpose and power and, and release of ministry. And uh, man, to see God's process unfold is, is amazing. Amen. Amen. Um Go ahead. I want to ask you a, a couple more personal things to just kind of show the process behind the preacher. And, um, you know, you're a man of prayer. You, you're a man of fasting. I don't know what you say publicly, but I know some details about your prayer life and fasting life and your, your study, and it, it challenges me. And I, I want to say thank you for how you live in private. And... Um, for those, for those listening or watching that want to be used by God, that want to know God and walk with God, I think knowing what you do in private is important. I think what, what we benefit the most from, from Scripture is from knowing how these men of God lived in private, and it reveals to us the background. What does your prayer life look like? What does your fasting life look like? What does your study life look like? Ooh, um, loaded question. Um, but yes, I, I agree um, that knowing elements of people's private life is important. My, my favorite books to read are biographies, autobiographies of pioneers and elders, Some, most, mostly of people in our movement, but even those outside of it, it's, it's mind-boggling when you read about their prayer lives. And um, biblically, the reason why we know about a 40-day fast, a three-day fast, an hour of prayer is because it was shared and it was written. So I think there's benefits in sharing and discussing. So I used to, t you know, Matthew 
uh, six or is it seven? But when, you know, when it says, you know, don't, don't let people know you're fasting, don't let people know you're praying, all that stuff. I, I take that very serious. You know, I'd never say anything ever. But then when we were training, raising people, they start asking questions and I learned to start sharing those things, not with a motive of patting myself on the back like I accomplished or I'm holier than thou. Motive matters. And so I began to bring people to my prayer closet, bring people into my fasting life. And then when I would go on a fast, I would share that with certain people in the church and tell them, this is how long I'm gonna fast. This is what I'm committing to the Lord. And this is, this is what I'm going through. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm not doing. This is how I prepare, you know, all that stuff. And so to be detailed, saying all that to agree with you that it's, I think it's important stuff like this is talk. So prayer life, um, me, I am a person that I kind of revisit my, my prayer life, my fasting life, my Bible reading life. I, I revisit it each year and figure out what am I going to do this next year so I'm not in a rut doing the exact same thing. So I, I adjust. Mm. It's not the same. So there's been years where I pray, you know, three hours a day, separated separated there's times where i would do um you know try to do that amount in one one bulk so like it's it's constantly changing so like this year this is my my focus this year is doing the psalm 55 17 which it says evening morning and noon you know will, will i pray will you hear my voice then psalm 119 um, where it says seven times a day, will I praise God? And so like, I'm determined this year, seven times a day, I'm going to praise God. And so throughout the day, I'm, and then um, um, it's escaping my mind right now. Psalm 1-2, where it says, uh, you know, a morning and evening will I meditate upon thy word. So I don't want to just read God's word in one setting. I want it to be multiple settings. So that's my focus this year. It's not so much a time thing, how many hours. But um, what I learned from back in 2020, God dealt with me about reading through the Bible every month. And so that was very different. I'd never done that before. And so every month, and what I learned about when you, and I, I couldn't read the Bible in one setting every time, uh, uh, read my daily allotment to accomplish a monthly goal in one set of times. It takes on average three and a half hours. Three and a half hours a day of reading to read the Bible through in a month. Yes, sir. On average, uh, depend, some days shorter, some days longer, because depending where you're at in the Bible and the content of what you're reading. But what I learned from that season was, is this? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Is this bulk? bulk. You just you're not stopping and focusing on a verse. You're, this is not your study time. This is bulk. Just getting it in. Yeah, and um, I, 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 I ended up making my own. Bible reading program, we call it the Bible binge. And so like I changed it up from the first, the first month was hard because I just went from Genesis to Revelation. That was, that was intense. And so what I ended up doing, I, I reconfigured it where I would read um, the needed chapters in, in, I would do Old Testament, New Testament, Proverbs, and um, Psalms. You do five Psalms a day every day, you go through the book of Psalms. You do one proverb a day every day, you go through the book of Proverbs. And then you do, um, I think it's nine chapters, uh, my mind's, I haven't done this in a couple of years, but I think it's nine chapters a day in the New Testament and then it's 20 chapters a day in the Old Testament. Basically, you got to read 40 chapters a day in order to read through the Bible in a month at that rate when you break it down. And uh, But when you're reading Old Testament, New Testament simultaneously, it helps the mind. But well, here's the point I was trying to make, I'm sorry, is that it, I always had to go back to God. No matter what was going through the day, I had to go back to read the Bible and it get me back on course, back on track, get my mind back on focus instead of on this project, that project, this drama, that drama. It realigned me. And so that's that I haven't done that since then. But what I want to do is that with my prayer life and my Bible reading life. Because usually the bulk of my prayer and um, study time is in the morning. That And then I, I do the rest of the day. And I may or may not intercede pray in the evening but this year i, I want to do it multiple times a day if that makes sense and so um that's my goal i want i want to i want my the bible says in isaiah 26 verse 3 that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee and this is how i'll keep my mind stayed on him and john 15 
5, you know, it says, without me, you could do nothing. And the whole context of the opening of John 15 is about, you know, abiding in him. And, you know, the branch cannot bear forth fruit unless it abide in him. And so that's my, my theme or focus for this year is to abide. That's my personal focus. Because right now I feel like I'm trying to force fruit and I, I don't have the fruit I'd like to see. But when I read the will of God, it's for there to be much fruit. And so to have much fruit, there has to be much abiding. And so that's my focus of why I've changed what I'm doing this year to have prayer and praise and Bible reading throughout the day. So I don't have to fabricate fruit. I don't have to, it should be a natural byproduct of abiding. And so that's my, my current prayer, fasting. To answer the fasting, uh, my prayer Bible reading, I'll have to answer fasting. Um, again, this is not boasting, but just to help people understand that what we read in the, Bible, in the Bible can still be done today. And I don't believe everybody has to do a 40 day. I don't believe everyone has to do a 21 day. I don't believe everyone has to do 14 days. As you probably know, talking uh, with Bart Stone King, he's never fasted longer than seven days. And you know, you just look at his life and his ministry. He didn't need to do 40 days to- He's dying in other ways. Yeah. And so, but I do f believe fasting, um, people should have that in their life. But, you know, I've done two 40 days. I've done a minimum of two 21. I don't remember if I've done more than two 21s, but I've done two 21s. And then a number of seven tens and 14s. Um, and then three, three day, no food, no water. And so the other fast I'm mentioning was just water, liquid, not, not eating any food. Um, but the... The, the three days I'm talking about, that's no food and no water. And um, for me, of all those fasts, the ones that is the most debilitating is the absolute fast, the three days, no food, no water. And uh, so those e e equal efforts don't mean equal results. So I, I don't want people to think that if they do the exact same things that I've done, that they're going to have the same life that I have, you know, because... That's a great point. I, that That's... The deception of consecration, if that, if I could put it like that. People think, well, man, if I just fast as much as him or if I pray as much as him, then this is what I'm going to get. Or if I, if I move to South Dakota, then this was going to happen. Well, there's other people that have pastored in South Dakota longer than I, and their life and outcome is different than mine. And it's not less than mine, and it's not more than mine. It's their purpose, their call, who they are, and what God has for their life. Yes, sir. And so um, that's, that's sometimes praying and fasting, and this may sound counterintuitive or counterproductive because I'm not, I, I believe people need to pray more and fast more. I, I firmly believe in that, but for the right reasons. And it's not so you can be preaching events. It's not so you can have miracles, signs, and wonders. It's, it's so you could abide in him. And I used to pray and fast for more power. And now God's changed me to pray and fast to find more problems mm. in here. In here, every time I go an extended season of praying and fasting, there's something inside of me that God's trying to work on. And that's what's changed everything. I, I don't view fasting for like, if I fast X amount of hour, uh, days, then I'm gonna cast out X amount of demons. If I, if I do this, then you know, God's gonna give me a word. I, I don't look for any of that. When I pray and fast in those seasons, I'm wanting God to work on me and help me. And Which you may or may not agree with this, but to me, that's kind of the most difficult part of fasting. And the most difficult challenge that arises in fasting is the emotional component to it. When God starts bringing things to the surface. Yes through fasting is like, whoa, I'm, I must be a failure. I'm, I must be missing the mark on this fast. It's actually the process you're talking about. God's bringing you to the surface to get rid of it and remove that resistance. Yeah. Have you felt the parallel? I agree 100%. That, 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 is, that is the thing for me. Every, every extended fast, God shows me something that's been dormant on the seabed of my soul. And fasting stirs it up and it, it brings it to the surface. And all of a sudden I'm like, man, that's what's in me. And it's, it's embarrassing. It's horrible, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's part of the purging, the purifying. And um, I'm, 
that's that's kind of how God's evolved my view upon it. And um, yeah. Well, thank thank you for being transparent about it. And it's interesting when you put this conversation with the previous of God showing you that your level of consecration was not matching the opposition you were facing in South Dakota. And, and looking at you now, you devote an extreme amount of focus to your consecration to Jesus. And it, it's not because it's cool. Well, I think I'll do this year's year. It's because it's cool. For you, it was a matter of survival. You, ha- you had to do this yeah. to survive and take it to the next level. And uh, man, I just, I think you're one of the most transparent people I've ever known. And I, I thank God for that. I think you encourage so many people when they look at you you know, you when you preach, I don't, I can't think of, except for the people that I know that have literally memorized the Bible, I can't think of another preacher that involves more word and references than you. And it's not because you're trying to be cool; it's because you're spending three and a half hours a day in Scripture and getting that inside of you. And anyway, this is just me saying thank you, Brother Mark, for for challenging us, for inspiring us, for being transparent, even to the point of your own wounds and, and getting nailed for being so transparent. You are helping so many people, myself included. I love you and I honor you. And man, it's a privilege to have you on today. And I'm excited about this weekend mm-hmm. so much. Well, thank you very much for letting me be here. And I love you. And, uh, you know, your ministry, uh, a big part of who I am now is is there's a thumbprint of Campitella in my life. Thank you, Jesus. And, um, I'm I'm just I'm grateful that God linked us together, you know, because I'm I'm kind of a loner. I'm 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 an isolated type person, and I, I've shared this with you before. You know, I I didn't have many friends, any friends, but when I began to pray and ask God, He gave me brothers, and you're one of them. You know, you and Chris Green and few others as well that just i i love you and um it's very important uh to have have brothers in in one's life and you're one of them thank you jesus did he say that like we wrote it out perfectly okay you did say it like we wrote it out thank you i love you i love you thank you for joining us it's it's our hope and prayer that you're encouraged by this and blessed by it and uh, make sure to like and subscribe share Put your comments in there. The Lord bless you. We'll see you next time in Jesus' name.